In July 2013, the UK Home Office launched a series of high-profile interventions aimed at directing public attention to an increasingly hard line from the government in controlling illegal immigration. The most controversial of these was a billboard which asked, in the UK illegally, go home or face arrest, which was mounted on a van and driven around London's boroughs. We found that there was a variation in the six areas that we studied around the country. Um, some groups had a really long history of organising around some of these issues, for instance South Old Black Sisters in West London, and they were able to get on the ground very quickly and, and make a noise. Places like Glasgow had longer histories of organising, so they could build on existing trade union links and bring people together. We found that some parts of the country People who were in insecure migration status didn't feel able to take part in any in the political debates, even if they now were had leave to remain. So in Cardiff, that was a real issue. In some areas, established anti-racist networks have been quite important in terms of those mobilisations and that, and that resistance. And for them, it's been important to restate the relationship between immigration controls um, and racism and racial profiling. So that's one kind of way in which people have been um, organising in local areas and resisting. So there are sort of established networks. Do you answer any questions? Do you not have to answer their questions? It's okay. We found that there was a much higher level of public debate and public outrage about the go-home ban itself, which was a very public stunt and very spectacular. Whereas other measures, for example, signs in the NHS telling people that migrants aren't able to access the NHS and everyday immigration raids drew a lot less hostility from the general public. Even people that were worried about immigration told us that they didn't feel reassured by the campaign and some people told us they thought it was all for theatre and it was just for show. So it didn't make them think any real action was being taken. In some areas, ethnic minorities that are subject to immigration controls have been part of the resistance to these Home Office immigration campaigns. But we found that actually they're kind of trapped in this Catch-22 situation because on the one hand, they're kind of talked about as a group of people, for instance, through the integration discourse, they're talked about as a group of people that are politically disaffected, that are disengaged in society and that are not connecting with political institutions. And that's seen as a kind of a negative reflection on those people subject to immigration rules. But on the other hand, they are also criminalised for political activity. So they may be getting involved, for instance, um, in responding to immigration campaigns in a local area because they are likely to be subject to those campaigns and their safety, their security, their freedom of movement is impacted by those campaigns. But they may be very concerned about being at the forefront of those political demonstrations. Also potentially face criminalisation and the threat of deportation. Then my child was like three months old when my husband was taken. They came into my house. They said they came in 4 a.m. I was sleeping with the kids. They came to my bedroom, opened my door. I was deep asleep. They saw me sleeping. They had their coffee in my sitting room. They had their coke in my sitting room. It was like their own place. Then 5 a.m., they come back. They tapped me, opened my eyes. People in my house, my children were sleeping. Everybody woke up. They handcuffed his dad and he was put at the back of their van. What really I want to ask today, do they even think about the children? It's really, really affecting the children. We found that several people who weren't previously aware of the go-home ban thought that maybe it was the work of extremists. Someone compared it to the EDL.
Ironically, perhaps, the Home Office campaigns have also given rise to new political subjects. So we found new layers of people coming into activism as a consequence um, because of their opposition to those campaigns. Okay. We found examples of how these campaigns can be divisive. For example, the Scottish Independence Campaign used the example of the Go Home van as something that didn't represent Scotland and a reason they wanted to separate from the English British Parliament. We found examples of young British Asians who were feeling like they might be asked to leave their home even though they were born here and British citizens. They were seeking legal advice to find out whether they would be asked to leave the country. We talked to some policy advisers about why they thought this tough campaign was going on and they said that politicians have found through their research that discussing immigration and discussing the facts about immigration don't make any difference to people's opinions because people don't believe politicians and what they say on immigration anymore. They've been told by politicians not to believe them. So the advice that policy advisers are giving government is that they need to show that they're tough on immigration whether or not immigration is a problem and whether or not that toughness would solve that problem. I think it's just creating a climate of fear around how people feel like whether or not they belong and there's so many, so much anxiety around immigration and status and belonging and it's getting mixed up with issues of race and racism too. Our research concluded in 2015 and we published a book of our findings in 2017. Between 2015 and 2019, we saw increased xenophobia during and after the Brexit referendum. The Windrush scandal, in which many British citizens of Caribbean origin were wrongly denied their rights, increased citizenship checks to access basic rights, and the highly publicised removal of British citizenship from teenager Shamima Bugham. How do our research findings relate to these situations? The move to deprive people of citizenship that we've seen really highlighted around the Shamima Begum case, although it's been happening long before that, has really cast a shadow, I think, over whole swathes of the British community. In the referendum campaign, that UKIP breaking point poster, we saw those kinds of images and messages being used in the run-up to Brexit. So I think, in a way, the van paved the way for that kind of public messaging and sort of made it publicly acceptable uh, for those kinds of anti-migrant sentiments to be communicated in that way. Part of what we were interested in is how those state performances impacted on minoritised and racialised communities, regardless of their immigration status. And in some ways we've seen a shift so that fans kind of came and went quickly. But some of what we've seen is in some ways even more frightening. What the Home Office's ability to deprive you of citizenship means if they only have to say you have the possibility of gaining another citizenship. So that all of those of us who have British citizenship who look like we might be the descendants of migrants are vulnerable. And I'm sure that that is also the intention, which is more frightening still. In terms of the Windrush scandal, in a way, what that did was make visible this unseen form of bordering that goes on, this sort of everyday misery that you would only know about if you were in contact with the Home Office and going through that process. But what was interesting about that moment was it did seem that it shifted uh, public opinion, for a moment anyway, on, um, on migration and belonging in this country. But then what didn't happen is... The, the kind of empathy that was shown towards the Windrush generation didn't transfer over to other groups. We have been keen to continue to explore immigration controversies in different ways. Immigration Otherwise was a collaboration with the organisation Act Real, which uses theatre and performance to communicate research in creative ways. In 2018, Act Real took our findings into two schools in Oxford and Coventry, Working from a draft script, the young people brought their own creativity and experiences to the research, 
workshopping the materials over 10 weeks into two different performances. Are you in the UK illegally? Go home! Or face the rest. We've seen a ramping up of uh, charter flights being used to do mass deportations. The use of the Home Office right to use to term people a foreign criminal as in order to prevent them from normalising their stay and to deport them as well. But when they say you can take my citizenship, what does it mean to be not conducive to the public good? Many fairly minor crimes, which of course people may or may not be engaged in, but if you're in a poor community, if you're in a community that faces dispossession, even David Lammy MP for Tottenham, Tottenham has said the hostile environment has pushed people into the hidden economy and the criminal economy. It's designed to do that. That's more likely to make you a foreign criminal than you're vulnerable to deportation. It's like a kind of Kafkaesque chain of, you know, I'm trapped here, then I get trapped here, then I get trapped here again. How do young people who have grown up in the hostile environment feel after learning about immigration control? We need the immigrants as much as they need us. Being a European immigrant, I shouldn't feel targeted with the way they present us, I so do. I'm not an immigrant, but after this place, I realise how much of an important issue this is. People, people, and you need to start treating them. I feel like people are making it more of a problem than it needs to be. We shouldn't build barriers to our skin colour or race. 